Tamriel, a land of adventure and exploration. Years after Skyrim's release, it's still being played to this day, but only a few have experienced its true history. And if you're thinking right now I'm ripping off Shoddycast, you're absolutely right. But we're not just gonna talk about lore, no. We're gonna talk about gameplay too, as we take a trip back to the history of Elder Scrolls games. And for that, we must start at the beginning. The Elder Scrolls, Chapter 1, The Arena. Because this game was officially re-released for free on the internet, I want you all to play it with me. Although the game was initially made available at ElderScrolls.com, we're grabbing it from a different source. Go to UESP, unofficial Elder Scrolls pages .net. In the sections box on the sidebar, click on Arena. On the Arena page under Downloads, click on Files. And under Arena Full Game, download the Arena Setup.exe file. The version you get on ElderScrolls.com doesn't have voice acted cutscenes and it is not fully patched. This version is not only fully patched, but it's also pre set up in its own DOS box, so it should just be able to run on pretty much any system. Now, a lot of people hear the title, The Arena, and think of The Arena in Oblivion, but the first game really isn't anything like that, and that was a mistake or misstep of Bethesda. In development, the game was simply titled Arena, and the concept was is that you would start off as, surprise, surprise, a prisoner, and you would have to fight for your life in order to clear the game. That's when they hit upon the idea of traveling to different areas and fighting in different arenas all over this fantasy landscape. And when they tested it, it turned out that the exploration and wandering was a hell of a lot more fun than the arena game they had designed. Inspired to not only draw up an intricate backstory, but also a main quest for the hero to do. The entire concept of the arena was thrown out. There was just one problem. All the advertising and promotional materials they had ordered already listed the arena as the title. So they made up a story snippet about how Tamriel at this point in time is referred to as the arena. The story is fairly straightforward. The Emperor and the leader of the Imperial Legion were both betrayed by their battle mage, Yegar Tharn. But rather than killing the Emperor, he banishes him to a plane of oblivion so that he can steal his appearance. So with the physical appearance as a Septum Emperor, he takes over control of the Empire, and he begins replacing the Imperial Legion with monsters in human form. Jaeger Tharn's most powerful apprentice, Rhea Silmain, is killed before she has a chance to warn the Elder Council. And so Jaeger Tharn purges the Royal Court, imprisoning anyone who opposed him. You are a minor part of the royal court who happened to oppose Yegar Tharn. However, your background and place of origin are a mystery. Do not fear for it is I. We are still made. Although there will be any number of side quests for you to do throughout the game, the main quest is handed to you by Rhea Silmain. Whenever you've completed a key part of the main quest, she will come to you the next time you rest. It is too late for me, for I am already dead. I can still work my magic to a certain extent. You will find a shift gate. It will transport you far enough from the center of the Empire that you should be safe. Remember, Tharn has taken on the guise of the Emperor. No one will gainsay his word for yours. The only way to access the Plane of Oblivion where the Emperor was transported to is to use the Staff of Chaos. Yegar Tharn used the Staff to kill Rhea Silmane, however, if the hero can get his hands on the Staff of Chaos, he can defeat Yegar Tharn and free the Emperor. Knowing this, Yegar Tharn took steps to make sure no one gets their hands on it. The Staff was indestructible due to its bind with the land of Tamriel. However, due to the fact that Tamriel had been split into different provinces, so too was the Staff able to be split into one piece per province, not counting Cyrodiil. And that is the hero's quest to travel to every province. Hidden within each province is a secret dungeon that the hero must discover. In Hammerfell, the Fang Lair. In Skyrim, Labyrinthian. In Valenwood, the Elden Grove. In Elsewhere, the Halls of Colossus. 
in the Somerset Isles, the Crystal Tower. In Black Marsh, Mirkwood. And finally, in Morrowind, the Dungeon of Dagoth Ur. Once all the pieces have been gathered, the hero can return to the Imperial Province with the Staff of Chaos in hand and raid the Imperial City, defeating Yegar Tharn and saving the Emperor. Now the best thing about the early Elder Scrolls games was defining your character. It will give you the option to either answer a bunch of moral questions which will determine your class automatically, perhaps not the class you wanted, or you can select one from a list. Now going to that list, you're only going to have a vague understanding of what each class brings to the table. Just like all the other major RPGs of its time, with Arena, you're going to want to reference the instruction manual. I will have a link to that in the video description below. Starting at page 21 and going down, you're going to see class descriptions, including the weapon types they can use, the armor types they can use, the shield types they can use, and how much health they start with. Now keep in mind that all classes were reworked for Daggerfall, Morrowind, and Oblivion. In other words, anything you know from those other games is not valid here. Now you notice there's no such thing as Magicka. They have spell points, and spell points do not regenerate except when you rest. So, you need to look very carefully if you want to play a casting character at the multiplier intellect for their spell points. So in this case, a battle mage has 1.75 times their intellect in spell points. Whereas with a spell sword or a knight blade, it's only 1.5. However, knight blades have the ability to do a critical strike for three times normal damage. Then you got oddball classes like sorcerers that don't generate magic on their own at all. What they do is they absorb incoming spells, and they can store up to three times their intellect in spells, and unless they're completely full on magicka, they will not take any spell damage at all. In other words, each class requires careful consideration as to what playstyle you want to do throughout the game. So in this case, I'm going to choose a knight. Now knights are very similar to warriors in the sense that they have no spells whatsoever. However, Knights also have the ability to repair their own armor. They don't have to go back to a blacksmith. They can repair their own weapons. They also have immunity to paralysis. Now in exchange for that, they level up much slower than a warrior would. Next, the game will ask you where you come from. Note that the Imperial Province is not an option. Again, you'll want to reference the instruction manual for the races. Nords, for example, take half damage from cold attacks, and if they get a saving throw, Normal races would get half damage from a saving throw. In the case of Nords, they take no damage. A Khajiit can climb out of a water pit easier, and they actually have a bonus to all their thieving rolls. In other words, if they're playing a thief class and they're trying to pickpocket or lockpick, the chance of it succeeding is much greater. Red Guards get a damage bonus to melee weapons equal to one third of their level. While it's slightly easier for a Nord to use a weapon and a shield, Bretons don't get that bonus. Instead, Bretons take that, that cold bonus that Nords get and extend it to all range of magic. So anytime they're hit with a spell, regardless of its type, they will take half damage from it. In addition, they if they get a saving throw, they'll take no damage. Argonians get a minor bonus to their thievery, and they also swim faster than any other race. You know that damage bonus that Red Guards get for melee weapons? Wood Elves get it for bows. High Elves are immune to Paralyze, and they get a natural bonus with all spells. Now Dark Elves basically take the Wood Elf and Red Guard perks and merge them, except with a slightly less competency bonus, so one-fourth of their level raises their hit with both melee and ranged weapons. So considering the character I want to play as is a Knight, and I want the highest melee damage bonus possible, I don't care about any of those other perks, I'm going with a red guard from Hammerfell. But to be honest, unlike classes, you can choose any race you want and still enjoy the game. Classes are really the only place you need to check the manual and be certain that that is what you want to play. The first thing you'll want to do upon entering the game is click on your own character portrait. Then go to the next page and you'll see a weapon. Go ahead and click on the weapon, which will equip it. 
Now the stat screen is very unintuitive. That is to say those plus numbers are not armor values, those are how much extra damage you take from that body slot. Meaning that when you equip armor, that plus 10 might become a plus 7, might become a plus 1. Might become a minus 6, in which case you take 6 less damage. See when it went from plus 10 to plus 1 when I put the helmet on? That means I'm only taking 1 bonus damage as opposed to 10. And as you get the higher grade armors later in the game, you will notice the difference. Next, you should familiarize yourself with the horrible user interface. Clicking on the sword icon will draw your weapon. In order to slash with your weapon, you need to hold the right mouse button and swing your mouse as if you were swinging the sword. To sheathe your weapon, click on it again. Now when you click on the map icon here, what'll happen is it'll bring up the local map. You can click anywhere on that map and type things. Although the third icon, Theft, is available to everyone, it is not recommended if you are not a thieving type character, that is, thief, burglar, acrobat, or rogue. The third icon brings up the status window. The status window is important for not only telling where you are, what time it is, the date, your carrying capacity, and whether or not you're diseased or poisoned. If you try to fast travel while diseased, your character will most likely die, so this is important. Now the first icon of the second row is magic, which is not available to this character. Next to that is the logbook. Whenever you get a quest to do, whenever your progress in the main quest advances, you should be able to see that here. You never need to click the camping button because the R button on your keyboard will do that for you. The only other thing you really need to know is that this map, you right click it, and it will open up the fast travel map, which is required to play the game, otherwise you'll be wandering around for quite some time. The headache of this game doesn't accelerate to the next level until you start using the controls. The arrow keys will move you around, however, in order to attack you need to use the mouse, so you're literally going to be grabbing the wrong side of the keyboard along with the mouse. However, to jump, you have to actually move your hand over and hit the J button. And to jump forward, you need to hold SHIFT and hit the J button. It's possible these controls might be able to be fixed with a macro software, but that's all I can really recommend. Substituting one keyboard key for another. In order to interact with your environment, you'll have to click. For example, clicking on this key will cause it to be picked up. Then clicking on this door will cause it to open. Corpses and piles of treasure should always be picked up. All loot in this game is randomized. I actually got a mithril sword off of this pile once. Guess how much easier the game was after that? Now goblins will appear. You just need to take them down efficiently. To loot a corpse you need only click on them. Your proficiency at killing enemies is based mostly on your starting stats and what class you chose and whether or not you equipped a weapon. Now if you try to rest on the ground of a dungeon, chances are you will encounter enemies. You encounter enemies less frequently if you rest in one of these niches, and that is by design. Now as you kill enemies, you will gain experience points, and experience points will level you up. This follows the classic RPG system. It has yet to evolve the idea that leveling up skills will give you levels. Rather, your competency with all skills and spells go up as your level does. For a melee character, you'll generally want to balance endurance and strength with a favor on strength. Once you get strength to 100, focus on endurance. Once both endurance and strength are maximized, level up whatever you want. You'll find piles of treasure, which are kind of hilarious, because you click on the pile of treasure, 76 gold pieces. It looked a lot more than 76 to me, but whatever. Now I have been guilty of getting lost in this opening dungeon a time or two. And where I usually get turned around is I don't realize the starting point is on the eastmost wall, and you exit heading west. And it's kind of funny how easy it is to go around and around and around when there's just one direct path right there. When you find the shift gate, it almost always sends you to your home province. Anyone who says Elder Scrolls V Skyrim is big should be drug out into the street and shot. Because these cities are huge. And there are a lot more of them. To put things in perspective, I'll head over to Skyrim. Specifically to Whiterun? No, to Riverwood. 
It's gonna take 22 days to get there. No problem. This is the village of Riverwood. Now the first thing you'll notice about Riverwood is that it is actually big. Sizably so. With city walls to protect it. Now when you're just getting started, instead of jumping into the main quest, it's recommended that you go into a tavern. Each tavern has its own unique name. Buying a room will allow you to sleep in the city without fear of being attacked. Sneaking into a room really doesn't work unless you're a thief class. But under rumors, you can actually ask for work. Now, not every NPC you talk to will have work for you, however, you'll notice that almost every city will have temple priests to speak to. In addition, these unique people, you can ask them where things are in the city. Note that to progress the main quest, it is almost always a palace you need to go to. Now just be careful about wandering around cities at night, because typically there are lizard men and creatures of that sort wandering around Skyrim at any time. And town guards will not help you. They don't exist for any reason other than to kill your face. Stop, thief. If you don't want the ending spoiled, stop watching the video now. When you compare Elder Scrolls 1 The Arena to Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall, Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall beats it in literally every aspect except one. And that one aspect is the one thing that we have not gotten out of any Elder Scrolls game. And that is the ability to go to any province we want. Aside from the main quest, there really isn't very much direction. You are simply left to explore this brand new fantasy world. The only thing that makes this game completely insufferable once you play Daggerfall are the horrible controls. You can remap the controls in Daggerfall, whereas in this you just basically have to suffer through them. But in terms of the foundation, they put you into a fantasy world that you are free to explore, and they made the right decision when they gutted the arena in favor of this. Yes, it was ambitious, but it set the stage for Elder Scrolls 2, and we'll get to that next time.